Coming up on this episode of Fast TV, we meet the Soil Farmer of the Year, harnessing science to improve the health of the land and livestock. And we revisit an arable farm in North Berwick, where a mintill approach has resulted in a successful harvest. Situated in Highland Perthshire overlooking the River Tay, Alex Brewster and his family farm at Rotmel Farm. This year marks a special anniversary for the family as they celebrate 40 years of farming at Rotmel, having taken on the business back in 1981. Rotmel is primarily a sheep and beef farm with 4,000 organic free-range hens. Alex is passionate about sustainable, regenerative farming practices, which has seen him travel the world studying a Nuffield scholarship. He was awarded Soil Farmer of the Year in 2020. Regenerative agriculture, I find that quite an ironic term, because we shouldn't need to be regenerating the landscape. If we farmed and I always had farmed in a sort of 24-7 process of thinking about the landscape and the soils beneath our feet, we wouldn't be needing to be regenerated today. But because there's been so much chemical ag and fair ag for 100, 100 plus years, we're now in a situation where we've got some fairly depleted soils across the world. And you know, even so in Scotland, if it wasn't for our continuous rainfall, we would be in real trouble because our organic matter is so low. Regenerative agriculture is about looking at the farm as a business, looking at it from the context of the whole, and then trying to work within the framework of the landscape. What, what I've had to try and do over the last six or seven years is understand how, how, how ruminant animals, pastoral plants, and soils, and the natural environment interact with each other, and try and rebuild that capacity in the landscape to sequester CO2 carbon, uh, there's 80 tonnes of atmospheric nitrogen above every hectare on the planet. That's all free. How do we pull that atmospheric N into the grasslands, into the soils? How do we feed the biology? And under my feet here, I've got about two and a half tonnes of potassium and about 1,800 kilos of phosphorus under my feet. How do we make that available to the plant? Back in 2012, so it's nine, so it was nine years ago, ten years ago, now, I was getting pretty fed up and disillusioned with it, to be honest. We kind of felt we were on a continual treadmill. You know, I liked what I was doing, but I was never really in love with it. I was never overly passionate about it. And then we were doing like EBV recording work with sheep and a bit of cattle, and we were all set stocked. And 2014, I got involved with the grazing groups program through QMS, and that well, that moved us into rotational grazing. We started to subdivide fields up into paddocks, you know, two and a half to three and a half hectare paddocks, and rotate stock. And there were some pretty big production jumps and live rate gains of lambs and calves and that, you know, and because everything's EID'd and we've got load bars in place, we heads, we can see that data very quickly. There was major gains to be made here. You know, I've never actually bought fertiliser. I've been home for 20 years. I can honestly say I've never bought a bag of fer. It's just not that we, you know, we had slurry, we had dung. So I'm not in that world. But through the rotational grazing system, we were growing more grass, we were growing a better quality of grass and less of performance jumped. But there was a couple of issues with that. On a 21-day rotation, we were parachuting lambs back into the worm, worm growth, or, or the worm populations grew, and we were car crashing lambs straight back into that, so we're continuing building this worm burden, which doesn't, you know, that's the biggest limit of lamb performance. Okay, so what's happening there? Worms become resistant to antilymptics, but the worm, if the immune system of the sheep's working, it'll knock the worm out. So is it the rotation that's wrong, or is it the amptolymptic is wrong, or the worm that's wrong? So when you start looking at total, total nutrition, if the nutritional element of the animal is right, the immune system will cope with the worm burden. And you, you extend the length of the rotation out, you start moving out beyond the parasite burden. That was some of the nuances we start to pick up with the rotational grazing system, and that's probably driven us then more down the longer rotation, which become the mob grazing, and it's now the regenerative type idea. And that's where we are with the farm at Rotmel. As the rotational length has got longer, the roots and the, the underground architecture and biomass of the plants have went deeper into the soil. We are able to capture far more rainfall. But the real trick here is when we're hitting these more prolonged dry spells of weather, as we have the last two or three years, 
the, the capillary action of the roots pulling moisture back up again has meant that the production platform has never slowed down. We've continued to grow grass, we've never dried out. So we're keeping the ground and the soils really well covered with pasture. We don't dehydrate, we keep growing grass. And the nuance of that is we're then growing in more confidence to extend the grazing length or the rest period to grow more biomass. Rotational grazing plays a major role in the farm management at Rotmel. Alex has designed an efficient grazing system which is beneficial for livestock, grassland and soils. So the, the, the Tarragate system we've designed in what we kind of call food and power pasture is that it's a diamond gateway system. So it means every paddock is completely interchangeable with, with every other paddock. So we've got four options from each gate as to, as to how we want to move stock. And they, you know, they, they adapt that really quickly. Uh, yeah, you just open the gate, you go straight across, or you can go right, or you can go left. And then actually in terms of la la lambing time and stocks, especially at lambing time actually, we'll set stock 10 yows per hectare. So you have 25 to 30 yows in a paddock, which then means we run a, 20, we run a 21 day lambing system here. Or we're top for, top for 21 days, or the top's top for 21 days. So on average, we've only got about 30 odd yews in a paddock, which means we've got a yew and a quarter lambing per day on average. So the chance of pinching, mismothering, all these wee niggles at lambing time we used to get have stopped. And we'll put 30 odd yews in maybe three of the four paddocks. We'll leave one empty. And then after day 10 or so, we'll just take the grit years out and put them into the last remaining paddock. And then quietly, we start moving the lamb yews through these gates with the pairs of lambs back into one mob and start to build by day, the lambs are averaging a fortnight old, so we'll start to build a quiet rotation. So you start off with wee, wee groups of 15s or 20s, and that can then come, become 30s or 40s, 80s, to 100s. But the flexibility you've got at lambing time to actually manage that process and to give the, but more importantly, give the sheep the peace and quiet to do the job for you is quite phenomenal. And the bit that people always can't get their head around is how will the stock adapt to the system? The stock will pick this up in four days. To them, operating as a big mob, as a herd or a flock is completely natural. It's the management that takes the time to get their head around it. And when they realise they're getting a fresh feed every second day, they, they sooner they, they adapt really, really quickly. As would you. If you were getting stale food and dirty plates, you'd get a bit grumpy. When you're getting fresh feed every other day, you learn pretty quick that if you move, you get through the gate. It allows you to, to check every piece of stock really well as they go past. Anything that has an issue, a lame foot or the like, tends to be the, in the last 10% of the mob. Just shut the gate, cut them off, take them home and deal with it. So what advice would Alex give to other livestock farmers? When you've always grown up doing something a certain way, you have to build a new knowledge bank. You know, to get the knowledge that we've got and get us to where we are today, we've had to have quite a few failures. And I'm, I'm confident enough in myself now that getting something wrong is not an issue. I expect to have a failure to learn something, to start joining dots to move to the next place. And I, and I accept that as part of the learning process. If you're wanting to move, I think with policy is going, we're all going to have to move further in this type of system, then just start off with 10% with of your farm. You know, start off with three or four hectares, fence it off, create a paddock out of it, make the fuel smaller, give it a 40 day rest period over the summer, Buying a big mob of stock into it for a couple of days, take them out again. Give them another 40 day rest period. See what happens. Dig a hole with a spade. You know, and, and that's how we've learned. And, and what you're really doing is building that confidence within yourself that this works without exposing your business financially. And as the confidence grows, you'll then think, okay, this works, this makes sense. And then you realise you can start stacking pasture for the shoulders of the season. You know, we, we're sitting on all this is mid-November, we're sitting on a lot, a lot of feed. It's been a glorious year for growing grass, but we're still sitting on a lot of feed. What that rest period does, you graze the grass off, there's so much energy and power sitting in the root systems. You've actually heated up the biology in the soil a wee bit, 
the plant responds far quicker again. The regrowth that comes back is phenomenal as long as you're patient and don't regraze the regrowth too quickly. So when you kick back around to March and April again, you've actually got feed waiting on you. You know, you're kind of geared to go and none of that's coming out of a bag. I'm not exposed to the retail or the commodity markets. And, and that's one of the strengths of the business nowadays is as the commodity prices fluctuate globally, we're not overly exposed to that, which gives a greater resilience to our, our business model on the farm. Alex has always wanted to develop his knowledge, challenge the status quo, and make continuous improvements at Rotmel. This drive and ambition saw him successfully complete a Nuffield scholarship, travelling the world to deepen his knowledge in soils and grassland management. I was really fortunate, you know, I didn't really know. I knew a bit about Nuffield back in 2015, but not a huge amount. It was a sort of project that somebody else did. You heard your family, your uncles and aunts talk about it, so and so, you know, 100 miles away to a Nuffield scholarship at his family party. And that was my level of knowledge about it, really. And a, and a pal asked me to go and apply for it, and I thought, you know, this is out of my league, I'll, I'll never get this. And I was super fortunate to be awarded a scholarship. And, and I went to look at, I went to set off on a journey to look at genetics, genomics, breed programs. That, that was where my focus was at the time. And as I got into this, I started to realize that diversity in breed programs was, was a good thing. It aided resilience to, to the animal. I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I got a bit more into soils and this diversity aiding resilience came up again. And all these weed snippets started joining together. And, and as I started to travel globally and, and ask a lot of those switched on people in research facilities and the innovative farmers, I started to realise that there was a real joining of dots here between the resilience of the genetic, the resilience of soils, the resilience of pastures. And then laterally, as I started moving into, into holistic land management, that, that was a you know, that was a fairly shocking moment for me looking at, at the holistic management as prescribed by Alan Savory and the like, that just took me so far out of my comfort zone. I had to go away and find a lay-by and stop for two hours just, just to decompress my head. Because ironically, everything I got told there made sense. You know, we invest a lot of money in-house into our own business and R&D projects. You know, soil, all big soil testing, leaf tissue sampling, micro micronutrients, and, and we've got various test sites across the farm that we're continually monitoring. And, and as the farming process evolves and changes, we're, we're back in mind, self-funding ourselves. Is this working? There's checks and balances here. And that's given us the confidence and the belief that yes, what we are doing is working. We're taking LFA ground and pushing the feed value of 12 and a half ME into a grass that used to be nine. And we're doing that through mob grazing, rotational grazing. We're seeing plant succession. We're seeing clovers, uh, legumes appearing where there was none four years ago. And this, the frustrating thing about it actually is I can't get it to happen fast enough. Your know, farming is a cyclical business. You, you've got 12 months in a year and every season comes round. That's the most frustrating bit is you have to wait to the next season to see the real uplift again. It's also the exciting bit. Don't look over your shoulder, be true to what you want to do and just go at it and go hard or not go home in effect. Back in the spring, we visited Castleton Farm in East Lothian and spoke to Stuart McNichol on his approach to reduce tillage. Recently, we caught up with Stuart to find out how this year's harvest went and how he's encouraging young people into agriculture through the modern agricultural apprenticeship scheme. Harvest 2021 was a fairly easy episode. We didn't have any weather issues, thankfully. We didn't have any ripening issues either. Uh, so this year, harvest was over and done with in about three weeks compared to seven weeks last year. Our spring barley, it yielded about 6.4 tonnes to the hectare, which is certainly a good, a good average for us, but I would certainly would liked it higher. But the reason we, we weren't higher was back in the spring, we didn't get the rain like everyone else did. So we had a very dry spring growing season. Our winter wheat yielded about nine tonnes a hectare. Uh, the field that we had a demonstration of last year for the bed in our drill, it yielded about eight tonnes a hectare. So we're absolutely delighted that the demonstration field 
with no cultivations yielded that amount. And our spring beans, after our winter beans that failed, they did about five and a half tonnes a hectare. So an absolute cracking yield. And at the end of the day, prices that they are this year are fantastic. Drilling campaign in autumn 2021, we have put in about 80% first wheat and uh, the rest is made up of, sec of second wheat. Sowing has been very easy this year because of the lack of rain and the conditions have been fantastic to drill into. Our drilling approach, our bed and omega drill continues from the previous manufacturer we had that we had for the last 10, 15 years. We've just updated our drill. So the new drill has the capability of, grow, of sowing fertilizer and grain at the same time. But it's also a unique drill in that we can go straight into ploughed land and cultivate straight away, or we can go into min till and cultivate. But the unique part of it is that we have a set of discs on it that cut a slot for the disc coulter to go in. So we can basically, if or effectively, strip tillage with no cultivation. If we go in with a direct drill, that's using five litres of fuel a hectare, where we would be using double, triple, quadruple that if we were ploughing and then cultivating and then sowing. And it's our time establishment as well. With a four metre drill, we're roughly four hectares an hour. The fact that we've got a drill that can sow four hectares an hour compared to the old system, which was about two hectares an hour, we've basically just gained extra time, which allows us to work more in our diversified businesses, be it in drift or in our new venture of the farm orchard that we're going to plant this year. What's great about the Pedna Omega drill is that we are able to come into fields that have not been cultivated. So even if it is slightly damp underfoot, where cultivated soils will be wet, any soils that are stubble or soils that have had green manure on, they'll be much drier. So that can allow us to extend our drilling period later into the season. There are a number of benefits of growing EFA cover crops, and Stuart has plans to introduce sheep back into arable rotations. The benefit for us for growing EFA cover crops during the winter is when we establish them, that's when we do our cultivation for the spring barley. So I've been in this field with a cultivator, which is a horse joker and TG bar. I've worked the soil to about six, seven inches deep. I've then uh, come in with my own grain drill and then I've sown my EFA cover crop and I'm gonna use the roots of the cover crop to break down into any pans that are there and also for the other parts of the cover crop species that are there uh, to leave a friable topsoil and it's to provide cover over the winter which we are intending on actually grazing sheep from the 1st of January which is then trying to get livestock back into our arable rotation and to improve the soil condition of our soils. Stuart is passionate about providing opportunities and encouraging young people into the agricultural industry. The Modern Agricultural Apprenticeship Scheme is a great initiative providing young people with valuable hands-on experience where they can develop skills, confidence and bring new ideas to the farming sector. Beginning of 2021, Lantra put on their Facebook page an uh, advert about the Modern Agricultural Apprentice Scheme. We decided to apply for that because we had a member of staff within our diversified business drift that potentially could be a candidate. We asked him, we applied and we got it. So we have Jack who is our apprentice, modern agricultural apprentice. Um, he is doing it through Borders College. Uh, he's on the farm two days a week with us. So he's learning everything that I do, be it from fertilizer spreading, to spraying, to plowing, to cultivations, to trying to work the new drill, um, office work, everything basically that an arable farm has. I started like, this year, uh, January, and I will be finishing my apprenticeship at, in start of 2023. Uh, I've loved it so far, uh, learning plenty, plenty of things, uh, everything's new. I've just finished my tractor training course and I've also done a JCB course. What advice would both Jack and Stuart give to anyone thinking of undertaking a modern apprenticeship? 
If anybody ever wants to do it, I'd say go for it. You just need to find a farm, that's the tricky part. And once you're in, you're in. Uh, and then you can go for loads, loads of different niches in farming. And I've just been cruising that way. The programme is worthwhile to all farmers because the average age of a farmer is 55 plus, where if we can get the younger generation in, and even the younger generation like Jack, who had no experience in the farm before, the colleges are there to help and they deliver a fantastic course. If you would like to find out more about the Modern Agricultural Apprenticeship Scheme, please visit www.scotland.lantra.co.uk. Uh, welcome to the crop arable update uh, for uh, the autumn, uh, brought to you uh, under the auspices of uh, the Farm Advisory Service. I uh, thought it an opportunity just to update you on the drilling campaign and uh, how the season's gone uh, so far. Um, it's uh, drawing to the end of November and this year, perhaps unlike last year, has been uh, an easier campaign to get crops in the ground. Last year we had crops that were suffering really from a plant count point of view and that really carried through to harvest. This year we've seen an open campaign with wheat drilled really from the beginning of the 1st of September. We've seen some wheats go into the ground in good conditions and indeed crops have been drilled through to the latter parts of uh, October and into early November with little detriment and across that two to three month period we've seen great plant counts uh, with little damage from slugs um, whether crops be at sort of three or four tillers or just emerging plant populations are good so it does all bode well uh, looking forward into 2022. Winter barley's too are very forward uh, we've seen some mildew but nothing that we don't think winter temperatures will take out. Some aphids too, but again, nothing to really worry us about in terms of uh, BYDV. Uh, oilseed rape, we've got some very good forward crops of oilseed rape, and indeed crops of oilseed rape that have, have gone in later, again, seem to have got away from the ravages of cabbage stem flea beetle or slugs. So, um, We've, most of the crops probably would have had the treatment for light leaf spot now and uh, that will be a holding program over winter so we can re reassess the disease levels in the spring before we decide to, if we're going to spray again. Uh, soil temperatures have dropped to about 7 degrees C now so that's really given us green light for any of the farmers that want to go on with propizomide. Um, um, pending rainfall of course and, and uh, taking due diligence with uh, uh, drains running etc. In terms of gauging any changes in the cropping area that's gone in this autumn compared to last year, we have surveyed uh, a, a number of acres across Scotland and the initial consensus is that wheat and barley may have dropped slightly uh, at the expense of oilseed rape, uh, winter beans, oats and other combinable crops having risen very slightly too. Um, the intentions for spring barley planting look unchanged from last year. And that really brings us on to uh, the issues that we're going to be facing uh, in the spring with high nitrogen prices being where they are. It could be conceivable that you'll be buying fertiliser if you haven't sourced it already for upwards of uh, £700 a tonne for ammonium nitrate, 34.5% N. And at that sort of price, you're looking at £2 a kilo of N. And when we look at the break-even ratio, if we take uh, wheat at £200 a tonne and uh, nitrogen at £2 a kilo, that's a break-even ratio of 10 to 1. And that really does start uh, the ball rolling on us asking questions about where that optimum end rate is for crops in the spring. And, and at the moment, ballpark figures are uh, an adjustment downward of about 50 kilos of N on wheat, about 40 kilos of N on oilseed rape, and probably about 30 kilos of N on spring barley. And indeed, we have got a webinar 
that will be advertised on the uh, FAS website on the 7th of December, which addresses that topic. Uh, you're welcome to join us and we'll be joined by Roger Sylvester Bradley from ADAS, who's done a lot of work in the break-even ratios and the optimum economic uh, point for N applications. So that'll be a topical issue uh, that we'll be covering off uh, in early December. Indeed, the outlook for uh, fertilizer production uh, in 2022 is, is still undecided and Europe actually is uh, completely dependent on gas for its uh, production of fertilizer. Uh, and with gas prices so high, one has to say that perhaps it doesn't bode too well for prices coming down. Uh, America have got shale gas uh, and indeed the UK fertiliser plants are shipping across ammonia uh, from America to incorporate into the fertiliser production facilities here. It really is very difficult at the moment to gauge where prices are going to go. Um, but certainly uh, a nutrient management plan for 2022 is going to be critical in terms of making the best use of what imported nitrogen, artificial nitrogen you're purchasing onto the farm. It's worth bearing in mind that if you are committing to high fertiliser prices and you want to underpin the price of uh, the 2022 harvest uh, grain crop, uh, keep an eye on the November 2022 futures. They are currently around £200 a tonne and it wouldn't be irresponsible to commit some of your tonnage to the market uh, pre-harvest just to underpin uh, your margins. Next time on Faz TV, we're in South Ayrshire exploring one farm's approach to outwintering cattle, growing kale and herbal lays to improve soil health and livestock performance. Mm -hmm.